Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. I'm totally pumped to be scaling surgical education and helping you be more confident on the ward, in the operating room, and of course, to crush those exams. We've done a bunch of basic science lately, and today we're gonna to get into clinical medicine. I'll bounce back and forth after a few requests, and today we're gonna to study something that is really the essence of general surgery, and that's the acute abdomen. Every day I get called down to the emergency room and inevitably there is a question on a child with an acute abdomen. Now I'm a pediatric surgeon, so that differential diagnosis is a little bit different depending on age than what you'll see with adult patients. But over years of training in adult general surgery and through my fellowship in ped surgery now as an attending pediatric surgeon, I've really honed my history and examination skills and I'm really excited to share those with you today. So let's go. We're gonna start this off by sharing a clinical case and I'm sharing this with permission. Now this is a eight year old female that came in the emergency room with right lower quadrant non-radiating pain. It was dull in nature and it started two days ago and it had been constant with no periodicity, reaching a severity of eight out of 10, aggravated by movement and pressure, relieved with rest and associated with some nausea, loss of appetite and low grade fever. On examination, she had a tender abdomen in the right lower quadrant, and her labs demonstrated an elevated white cell count, elevated CRP, and an ultrasound showed a 12 millimeter appendix. All right, so this history, examination, labs, and some imaging gave me the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. I took her to the operating room. I'm gonna show you just a short clip of what I found. Now you can see here that the appendix is pretty gangrenous, and we call this gangrenous appendicitis. You can see that the entire wall of this appendix is basically necrotic. Now, I'm gonna show you the way that I dissected this particular appendix, and depending on how the appendix is sitting in the abdomen, I may approach it a little bit differently. This one was quite stuck down the, to the uh, retroperitoneum, and so I dissected it out, and then I decided to take the mesentery with hook electrocautery. You have a couple of options. You can either take the mesentery with a stapler, or you can take the mesentery with a, another electronic sealing device, like a harmonic or a ligature. But I like to use hook electrocautery, and I show you that here. I come right down the mesentery. I stay in between the appendiceal artery and the sick appendix, and I make sure not to get into the artery and not to get into the appendix and I take that down all the way down to the healthy base. Now you can see me dissecting out the healthy base, the appendix, and this is where you now have a couple of options. You could take this with an endo loop, you could take this with hemoclips, you could take this with a stapler. And in another video, when we talk about appendicitis, I'll show you an example of how I do an appendectomy, the trochars that I use, the dissection technique I use, and then how I divide the appendix and take it out of the abdomen. So now let's talk about why we're talking about the acute abdomen. Well, I got to it a little bit earlier. Why? Well, it's because that's what we do as general surgeons. We are called down to evaluate this black box called the acute abdomen, and we have to make a decision. We have two decisions to make. And why is this lecture important? It's important because I'm gonna arm you with the questions you need to ask in the history and the techniques and things you need to elicit in the exam to decide which labs you're gonna do, which imaging you're gonna do, and finally, are you gonna to decide to go to the operating room and how do you get prepared? In future videos, we'll talk about the different etiologies of that abdominal pain and how to treat those, and we'll also talk in future videos about septic shock and its treatment, but we won't get into that today. All right, so let's get on to the history. Okay, so there are two questions that you need to be able to answer after you evaluate somebody with an acute abdomen. And number one, you need to know or have a pretty good idea of what's the diagnosis. And number two, do you need emergent surgery? So number one, what's the diagnosis? Number two, do you need emergent surgery? Now, how do you do that? You perform a history, you do an examination, you'd get some labs, and if you need to, you get imaging. A few clinical scenarios for you to think about 
Before we dive into the history are take these. Take a 65 year old male with acute onset, severe epigastric pain, confusion, and dizziness. How about a 44 year old female with a history of intermittent right upper quadrant pain with meals, now with severe epigastric pain radiating to the back? How about an eight year old male with constant non radiating right lower quadrant pain with nausea and loss of appetite? As we go through the history and physical examination, I want you to think about these scenarios and how you can ask particular questions to dive down into that diagnosis and how you can use your physical exam to help you elicit the right signs that point you to the right diagnosis. And then you can further confirm these with labs and imaging data. So when I was a third year medical student at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, we had a profound focus on the physical exam. Now, when I went to the nine best books and I reviewed my nine favorite books in surgery, one of my favorite books is on there and it's Tally and O'Connor's Clinical Examination. I highly recommend you go and buy this book. If you're a medical student or resident, it's a fantastic evaluation of the physical examination and everything that you need to know. Now, when it came down to doing the history, one of the surgery residents, when I was at it, rotating on my surgery rotation, he told me a acronym for the pain history and I've used it ever since then. I still use it today. Now there are a couple of reasons why this acronym is really good. Number one, I think it goes in order of the way you would logically ask questions and the way that you would deliver the bullet to your attending physician or write it in your note, okay? And so this acronym is SRN OPD Sarah. Doesn't sound like anything. It's kind of a mumbo jumbo type of uh, mixed letters, but SRN OPD Sarah. And we'll go through that. And so the first reason, good order, logical progression. The second reason is that for completeness of your notes, you should have at least eight features of the history presenting complaint. And so if you use SRN OPD Sarah, you get 10. All right, let's go through it. So SRN OPD Sarah stands for site, radiation, nature, onset, periodicity, duration, severity, aggravating, relieving, and associated. It's a mouthful, but it's super helpful to do this in order and to do it the same way every time. Take this clinical scenario. Here I'm gonna give you an example of a bullet for a 35 year old male who came in with right upper quadrant pain. Now go ahead and read that for yourself. And you can see how there's a logical progression to the questions and to the presentation of the information. It makes sense. By the end of this, you get a pretty good idea that you've got somebody coming in with biliary colic. Now, if you're presenting to your attending and it's two in the morning and you say things that are in a logical order, it is very easy to listen to and also you know that that person has a process and a way that they evaluate patients and take a history and that's really important for medical students and trainees. Now we can go through each of these. Sight, why is sight important? Well there are nine quadrants in the abdomen and each of these quadrants will have particular organs or referred pain and we'll give you an idea of what's the underlying condition or reason for this patient coming in with a sick belly. Now we don't need to go through each of these right here, but later in the talk, we're gonna go through each of these regions and talk about in a particular patient, if they come in with pain in a particular region, what should you be worried about? What questions can you ask? All right, now moving on to radiation, this is gonna be a pretty familiar image. So if you have pain that's radiating to that right shoulder, that could be perforated duodenal ulcer. Pain down the left shoulder and the left arm, you know, you might have to be thinking about a myocardial infarction. Um, pain in the central back, that's pathognomonic of acute pancreatitis, but also think of dissecting aortic aneurysms. 
as the pain gets lower on the left flank or the right flank, you could start thinking about renal colic or pyelonephritis. And then as it gets in the lower back, start thinking about uterine pathologies, rectal pathologies. On the front side, we have biliary pain, and that's typically right upper quadrant pain that radiates in the right flank. Um, renal colic pain is in the right flank. Posterior flank radiates down in the right groin. So there's a lot of these radiating patterns, and teasing these out in the history can really can help you locate the organ and the pathology. You know, so and for nature, this is sharp, dull, really getting to the character of the pain. I'll ask kids, you know, does it feel like I'm pinching you if I'm trying to elicit sharp pain, or does it feel kind of like a dull ache? This can give you an idea, again, of what particular pathologies will give these type of presentations. Onset is when the pain began. So if the pain started three months ago, is when you first started having that right upper quadrant crampy pain after meals, then it's three months. If it's appendicitis and it was yesterday at 8 a.m. or it woke you up this morning at 3 a.m., then that's the onset. Getting into periodicity. So periodicity is the pattern of the pain. So is it constant, which would be typical of acute appendicitis? So that periumbilical pain that started yesterday at 3 p.m. and it's been with me the whole time. Now it's down in the right lower quadrant. It's kind of moved, but it's constant. It doesn't come and go. When you have those pains that come and go, those can be closer to gastroenteritis or a uh, bowel obstruction. You know, the, the pain with renal colic typically is that kind of really sharp, irritating pain that comes and goes, not constant. Uh, renal pathology's constant pain would be more like pyelonephritis. On the biliary side, you know, if you have that pain that comes and goes with meals, that's biliary colic. If you have that constant right upper quadrant pain, then you have to be thinking more like cholecystitis. So the pattern of the pain, how long it lasts for, is really important. Duration, so when you do have some periodicity, so it's not constant, how long is the pain lasting for each interval? And then what's your break? So you get a break of five minutes, you get a break of 15 minutes, the pain only come on for 30 seconds. So try to get to that. You know, the, it's easier to tease out the difference sometimes in peptic ulcers, duodenal ulcers versus gastric ulcers, depending on kind of when the pain comes on and how long it lasts for. Getting to severity, this is that how bad is the pain on a scale from zero to 10, 10 being the worst pain you could ever imagine. I'll also say, you know, have you ever had a pain like this before? and that'll help kind of dial in how severe the pain is. And I like to get a progression of severity. So, you know, did it start out at a three and now it's a 10, or did it start out as a 10 and now you're feeling a little bit better? That kind of might be a pattern of gastroenteritis, whereas appendicitis typically always gets worse until it perforates, then you feel a little bit better, and then it gets worse again. Aggravating, so this is what are the things that make the pain worse? So this could be everything from moving or hopping, jumping, to uh, pressure, to eating. So any of those things that make the pain worse, you kind of want to include that. And uh, relieving symptoms, so does lying still relieve it? That would be kind of typical of appendicitis, makes it feel better. Uh, whereas in you know, a renal stone, lying still doesn't help at all. In fact, um, patients with renal stones will be moving all over the place, and that's how you kind of know it probably is an appendicitis. And then associated, so these are the findings. So in biliary disease, associated, we might want to tease out, have you had any jaundice? Have you had any icteric urine? Have you had any pale stools? Have you had any fevers, chills, rigors? Uh, with appendicitis, have you had diarrhea? That would be more um, in keeping with perforated disease. Again, fevers, chills, rigors, signs of sepsis. So you can kind of uh, tease these out in the history. And this is all 10 of them. So SRN, OPD, Sarah, site, radiation, nature, onset, periodicity, duration, severity, aggravating, relieving, associated, you get them all. By the end of that, you're gonna have a nice bullet that you can deliver to your attending, a nice bullet that you could put in your HPI, and when you put it all together, you're gonna have a good idea where everything's coming from. And so there's a few other things to think about when you're taking the history. So the patient's age. So children are gonna have a differential diagnosis that's a little bit different than an elderly person. So in a child, I'm gonna be thinking a little bit more like, okay, could this be intussusception? Could this be gastroenteritis? Could this be hemolytic uremic syndrome? Um, could this be malrotation volvulus? Could this be an atresia? There's gonna be different things that I'm gonna think about in a child, as opposed to an elderly person that might have had previous surgery, you might be thinking of bowel perforation, peptic ulcer disease, biliary colic, 
cancers that have perforated or they're obstructing, uh, diverticulitis. So age plays a really important part. So gender, so this brings in all the differences between the male and female organs. So in females, you're gonna to have to pay more attention to this in thinking about ovarian etiologies like ovarian torsion, uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, ectopic pregnancy, endometriosis. In males, you won't have those things, but maybe you'll have uh, testicular torsion can present with abdominal pain. Moving on to comorbidities, so you take that patient who has atrial fibrillation, you know, they have a higher chance of having a clot throw off and go down and cause mesenteric ischemia. If you have somebody with HIV, maybe they have a opportunistic infection causing their abdominal pain. Finally, medications. So if somebody's chronically taken NSAIDs, you know, they have a higher risk of peptic ulcer disease. If somebody is taking steroids, then they have a higher risk of having a mast exam. Sometimes they present with abdominal pain, but they have a fairly benign exam and your antenna have to be more sensitive in those patients. So age, gender, comorbidities, medications, make sure you include those in your history. Now let's move on to the physical exam. And so over the years from medical student on up through resident, fellow and attending, you will really hone these skills. So after you take a good history, you'll be able to start your physical exam and you will look for particular things and elicit particular signs which will really secure the diagnosis. And for me, it all starts at inspection. So the same resident gave me this acronym Chandler and I use it every day and now it's kind of like breathing when I walk into a room. So Chandler is what I start with when I walk and I see the patient and it's just a list that goes right through my head. So color, hydration, alertness, nutrition, disability, the limbs, external support, and respiratory distress. I go through each of this. Is this a patient that has good color, they're well hydrated, they're alert and orientated with good nutritional status, no disability, all limbs are intact, no external support, no respiratory distress? Or is this somebody that is pale in color with dry mucous membranes, is not oriented, and looks like they're cachectic, who is unable to get out of bed, his limbs are pale, he is on uh, IV fluids and vasoactive medications, and he's breathing at a rate of 40. So that's a much different patient, but that list has gone through my head in the first five seconds of going into the room, and I have a really good idea, is this somebody that's sick, not sick, what do I have to pay attention to? When we move on to palpation and the abdominal exam, just think of feathers, light touch. You don't need to do deep palpation in an examination of the acute abdomen. I will generally get down on my knee so that I'm level with the patient, and after I ask them for permission to put my hand on their abdomen, I'll put my hand very lightly on the area that's furthest away from their pain, and I'll just leave it there and I'll talk with them. And I'll examine in all quadrants with the last one being that area where they're having pain. The books might say proceed to deep palpation, elicit rebound tenderness, when you do this, you're gonna hurt the patient. And also, you might lose a little trust if you hurt the patient. So I recommend light palpation in the abdominal exam. I think that's all you need. In addition, when you lay your hand on the patient, you can feel the guarding. You can feel the muscles contracting under your hand. And in a patient with peritonitis, you can ask them to relax and they can look relaxed, but the, pit, but the abdomen might be guarding and you're only gonna feel that if you're lightly examining the abdomen. For percussion auscultation, the acute abdomen, I kinda think it's a question mark. And I can't remember the last time that I've listened to a patient's abdomen because even though there is a sacred doctrine in surgery that a quiet abdomen means peritonitis and that the loud, tinging sound of bowel obstruction are present, it doesn't really give me a lot of extra data. So with the abdominal, abdominal exam, I think inspection and palpation are probably the two most important things. If you do feel that you need to listen, particularly for vascular etiologies, maybe, maybe renal artery stenosis or a venous hum over the liver, uh, or you wanna listen for that tinging and bowel obstruction, then by all means do that. And so here I thought it'd be good to go through um, the different regions of the abdomen and kind of think about what you should be expecting in each region. So let's say somebody comes in with central abdominal pain. What are you gonna be thinking about? So here, depending on the history, this could be everything from intestinal colic to acute appendicitis, 
bowel obstruction, could be mesenteric ischemia, uh, volvulus, myocardial infarction. Basically, this could be anything. So you're really gonna have to use your history and physical examination to try to dial this down. But central abdominal pain is basically the black box. This could be almost anything in the abdomen. So let's switch this up a bit. Let's say that you have somebody with central abdominal pain, but now they're decompensating, they have shock. This could be a huge variety of diagnosis. Everything from sepsis and septic shock to intestinal ischemia, myocardial infarction, ruptured AAA, aortic dissection, ectopic pregnancy, could be a lot of different things. So you hear, while you have to rapidly start treating the patient, you gotta figure out what's the etiology of their decompensation. And the last on the central pains, let's say you have central pain with vomiting and distension. So what's this likely to be? So here you wanna think obstruction. So if they had a previous abdominal surgery, is this an adhesive obstruction? Have you done a complete hernia exam? There are a few things that will make you feel sick to your stomach, like identifying a femoral hernia on a CT scan of the abdomen that you didn't identify on your physical exam. So if you have somebody that comes in with pain, vomiting, and distension, you have to examine all of the hernia orifices. You have to ask them a good history for previous surgeries. You might want to think like, is this somebody that could have a volvulus? You know, did they have a history of gastroschisis or malrotation as a child? And then, could they have an intraluminal obstruction? So um, could this be somebody that has an obstructing cancer or an intussusception causing an obstruction or a polyp causing an obstruction? So a lot of things to uh, figure out, but if somebody comes in with pain, vomiting, distension, think obstruction and then elicit that history and perform the right exam. So let's take that patient that comes in with pain and rigidity. So they have peritonitis. This is usually perforation. And so this could be a perforated ulcer, perforated appendicitis, perforated diverticulitis, a perforated intestinal carcinoma, but somebody that has extreme pain, rigid peritoneal abdomen, I want you to think perforation. Going to our different quadrants, so what are you gonna think when you have somebody that comes in with right upper quadrant pain and rigidity? So right upper quadrant pain and rigidity means you have some local inflammation. So that could be everything from a perforated duodenal ulcer to a right lower lobe pneumonia. You could have cholangitis, hepatitis, cholecystitis. So there's a few things that it could be, but definitely think about the organs that are in that right upper quadrant. Moving to the left upper quadrant, so this is a little bit more rare. So here, what are you gonna think about if you have somebody that comes with pain or rigidity in the left upper quadrant? What's up there? So here you would think about things like acute pancreatitis. So tail of the pancreas is inflamed, left upper quadrant, that's gonna give you some pain and rigidity there. You could think about a perforated gastric ulcer, gastric volvulus, maybe organoaxial gastric volvulus could give you some severe left upper quadrant pain. And you may also wanna think about things like splenic rupture or splenic artery aneurysm. There are some usually rare things that are in that left upper quadrant. Now the right lower quadrant, that's the question I get asked almost every day, a couple of times a day, you know, what's in the right lower quadrant that's gonna cause you pain? For me, it's one, two, three appendicitis, but there are other things in the right lower quadrant as well. So here you could have appendicitis. You could have a perforated duodenal ulcer. There's a particular sign that's a perforated duodenal ulcer with right lower quadrant. I'll let you think about it. I'll tell you a little bit later what that sign's called. Think of tiflitis, Meckel's diverticulitis. There are also ovarian pathologies that can give you pain, like ovarian torsion or hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. And then pyelonephritis can give you pain in that right lower quadrant, as well as testicular torsion. Moving over to the left side, if you have left lower quadrant pain and rigidity, what's that gonna be? Well, that could be things like diverticulitis, colitis, again, ovarian pathologies. So now that we got the exam totally figured out, what are we gonna do with our labs? So there's a set of labs that is very useful in diagnosing the acute abdomen. So the first thing I like to get is a CBC, and you can do a complete blood count with differential. That's gonna give you the percentages of the different white cells, so you can see if there's a left shift with your neutrophils, uh, and that might put you in the direction of a bacterial infection in the abdomen. I also like to get a metabolic uh, profile. So is this uh, somebody that has electrolyte abnormalities that we're gonna have to correct before an operation? You know, So for instance, if they've had a pr profound amount of vomiting, maybe they're gonna be hypochloremic and uh, hypercarbic. 
a liver blood test or a liver function test. I think liver blood test is a little um, more appropriate because the blood tests aren't really a um, measure of liver function. They're just kind of a, an analysis of where the liver is at. And so these like your AST, ALT, can you give you an idea of do you have any inflammation of the liver? Your analysis is helpful. The, your analysis is helpful, you get a rule out of your UTI. You also get to, and sometimes in appendicitis, you'll have leukocytes present in the urine, but the urinalysis I think has helped you there. If you have blood in there, maybe you're gonna be thinking that this could be you know, a, a renal stone or something like that, giving you your abdominal pain. Amylase, lipase, and then of course, a beta HCG for a pregnancy test. These are kind of the six tests that I think are most important when you're evaluating the acute abdomen. And then imaging, finally is imaging. So you've done your history, you've done your physical exam, now you get to imaging. And so I like to think of imaging as a ladder, okay? So you have some fairly straightforward imaging orders that you can get that are gonna give you a lot of information. So take plain films. So plain films can be helpful in appendicitis. You know, you get a plain film of the abdomen, maybe you're gonna see an appendicolith right there, or maybe you're gonna see a renal stone right there. Maybe that's gonna seal the diagnosis and you don't need to get another test. So in this example here, we have a young child who had abdominal distension and tachycardia playing from the belly, did show this area of concern right here. And then you wanna make sure that you position the patient appropriately. So if you're looking for pneumoperitoneum, you wanna be able to get an upright film or in a child or a baby, we might do what I did here, which is to get a lateral film. And indeed, that area of concern shows a significant amount of pneumoperitoneum, and this child required an operation. The next step up the ladder would be ultrasonography. So ultrasonography can be really helpful when evaluating the ovaries, really helpful when diagnosing cholecystitis, really helpful when diagnosing appendicitis. So here in this particular ultrasound, we see that we have a dilated fluid filled structure in the right lower quadrant. This was a diagnosis of appendicitis. Now finally, you can go to axial imaging. And axial imaging could be a CT scan or it could be an MRI. And so for example, in this picture here, this was a CT scan of somebody that needed a little bit more information. The story wasn't totally clear. Uh, and so we got a CT scan. Can you find the appendix in this picture? How about if I blow it up for you? All right, so this is the appendix right here. It was a retrocecal appendicitis, which, which was why the story was a little bit more fuzzy, um, but this child went to the operating room and got their appendix out. And so finally, after doing your history, your physical exam and your labs, you do your imaging that you think is appropriate, and hopefully you've answered these two questions. Number one, what is the diagnosis? Number two, do you need to go to the operating room? And after you've made those decisions, then you kick into action your management plan. Sometimes you're putting this plan into action as you're getting your data because a patient is really sick. So do you have the IV access you need and have you started resuscitation? Are there any labs that need to be corrected? Do you have blood or do you need to get blood to resuscitate this patient? Should you put a Foley catheter in to monitor their urine output and determine where you're at in the resuscitation so you don't overload them with fluid? And then finally, did you start your antibiotics? As any patient with sepsis, you gotta get those antibiotics going as soon as possible on your way to source control. So to summarize this up, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. This is really the essence of general surgery and I hope that all of you will come away with this with a process to get your history, perform your physical exam and think about those labs and the imaging that you need to secure the diagnosis. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. I love this topic, the acute abdomen. It's what we do every day. If this got you pumped up, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the reminder tab, then you'll know when all the videos are coming out. Go ahead, check out citizensurgeon.com, join our community. I have an email newsletter that goes out. We have worksheets, review questions. Um, I'm really pumped about this idea of scaling surgical education, creating a resource for medical students, trainees, surgeons out there who might just need a review or a refresher, but this is gonna be totally available to you. So join Citizen Surgeon. All right, peace out.